Welcome back to another Blue Demon Exchange. I'm Sarah Kustak and I'm thrilled to get to be back here again. I was a member of the DePaul Blue Demon women's basketball team, of course, but I was also a Chicago kid. And my formative years of falling in love with the game of basketball coincided uh, with the brilliance that we saw in the Chicago Bulls dynasty. So more than anything, I'm thrilled to welcome in these two legendary guests in my eyes, not only a part of the DePaul family, but also embedded uh, in Chicago basketball. Uh, first, Bob Sakamoto and Dave Corzine. It's wonderful to see both of you. It's always a pleasure getting an opportunity to see um, each of your faces. Bob, first, fill us in a little bit about our ties. I've known you since I was in high school, but your connections with Chicago and with DePaul, of course. I was made the Bulls beat writer in 1984. And so for the first four years of my career and the first four years of Michael Jordan's career, we all synced up together. We were both rookies at the same time, got to know him back in the days when he was much more natural, wasn't a prisoner of his fame. Um, I spent 32 years at the Tribune altogether, four years covering Michael and the Bulls. And then after that, um, moved on to DePaul it's wonderful to see. Well, Bob, we're going to get into your stories about Michael Jordan and about those Bulls teams in just a moment. But first, Dave Corzine, anyone that knows Chicago basketball, knows basketball in general, should know who you are. Um, but tell us more about your story, about your time with the Chicago Bulls, and of course, what you're doing with DePaul. Well, obviously, I was born and raised in Chicago, and one of the best decisions I made uh, coming out of high school was to attend DePaul University with Coach Ray Meyer and we enjoyed our time there, and then I've always been uh, connected to DePaul in some way. Recently, 10 years, I was the uh, community outreach director, did a lot of work with the community. And then, fortunately, I, I retired the last couple of years, but fortunately, they're still allowing me to do the games on the radio for men's basketball, so I, I continue to have a connection to the school right now. And then I played uh, 13 years in the NBA, seven of those years with the Bulls, and um, the first two without Michael, the last five with Michael. So I was kind of there, unfortunately not for the championship years, but kind of the transition years as, I, as Michael and the Bulls developed. Well, and you saw so much of, of those early years, which I think for us, and I think about me as an eight, nine, ten-year-old kid, um, I got to watch him on the TV screen, and he filled us with so much joy. And I think for now, um, all of us during this current global pandemic, we miss live sports so much, but the last dance every Sunday, and I think every day in between, because we continue to talk about it, has absolutely captivated all of us in getting a chance to go back and, and relive some of these moments, memories, see the words of Michael and, and teammates as they speak about it now. But Bob, I, I'm going to first ask you, and I want to hear this from both of you, from your perspective and your inside look at this, what are some of the things that you think helped Michael become who he is? One thing that was missing, I think, a little bit was the more human, the more sensitive side of Michael. When he first came up, he was such a kind of a naive college kid. Um, he was open to anything. And I'll never forget the first time he ever um, worked with the Make-A-Wish Foundation uh, and tried to make true, make, uh, bring to life a wish for a terminally ill child. His name was Josh. He was 10 years old. And Michael took to him immediately. Michael loved kids. He just, um, his whole life, he always got along great with children. And so him and Josh actually became more than just basketball player and, and patient. Um, they became fast friends. They would talk on the phone all the time. I'll never, I'll, I'll never forget the day that the lady from the Make-A-Wish Foundation came to the Bulls locker room and wanted to talk to Michael. And I said, what's up? And she said, uh, I've got bad news for Michael. Josh passed away this morning. And she said, I want to bother him right now with it. He's got a game tonight, but his parents, Josh made his parents promise that Michael would hear it from us first and not anybody else. So she went in and told Michael the news and I just, I walked in with her and the look on Michael's face, his head just dropped and you could see he was just trying to understand how this could happen. Because it's his, in his world, everything was, I mean, he was always walking on sunshine. He was, you know, so optimistic, everything was always turning up positive. He was the best player in the NBA eventually. So all these things, he just couldn't fathom death at this early age, he was 21 years old. Just before I got back to the locker room, they pulled me aside before the media session and said, said, Bob, please don't bring this up in the media session because I don't want the other writers to think I'm making excuses for my performance. So I 
kind of kept me quiet. Incredible story, and that is such um, insight that we don't always know about someone like Michael Jordan. And, and Dave, you talked about, unfortunately, missing out on those championship years, but I think even more fascinating for us is understanding what Michael was like coming in as a rookie in those early years with the Bulls. What did you see that you felt like was part of what made Michael Jordan who he is? Well, first, I would agree with, with Bob that he was very – Naive is, is a word that could fit, but he, just any other rookie coming out of college, he had a great family life, a great family structure, great uh, university in North Carolina. There. They had won the, NBA, the NCAA championship, Dean Smith. He was very respectful of elders, coaches, anybody in authority position. He was just a, a rookie coming in ready to, to learn and, and, and earn his position in the league. He didn't come in with an attitude or, or – feel that he was better than anybody else. I and mean, obviously nobody at that point realized what he would become. He was a third pick in the draft. So he just came in and was willing to be part of the team and and learn and, and grow with the team. And I, I think that uh, Michael, as, as a person, was just that type of guy. I, mean, I, I think as his career grew and his fame grew, he had to isolate himself somewhat and learn to separate himself from the fame and the fans and everything around it. But uh, I don't think that he changed very much as a person. I, I feel that he stayed pretty much the same way he was as, as he grew up. I think it was interesting to watch the uh, documentary and see I, that was a different Michael in some respects than I knew because they already won five championships at the point this documentary heading towards their sixth. Uh, my first five years with Michael there, we hadn't won a championship yet. So in some ways, it was a different environment, but I think as a person deep down, he was the same person. Dave, is there anything else in this documentary that has stood out to you? As I said, a lot of it I happened after I left the team, so I don't have first-hand knowledge of a lot of the things that are going on in the documentary, but again, I think I get the impression that people are getting a negative view of Michael in terms of his ability to be a good teammate or how he acted as a teammate, and I, I think that's far from the truth. I think Michael was competitive. He was one of the greatest players, the greatest player in the history of the game, and he wanted to win championships. The knock on Michael when he got into the league his first few years there was he was just a scorer and couldn't win championships, and that was the difference between great players and just scorers. And at that point, he was just considered a scorer, and he had to prove that wrong. And but that transition period that I was in, and then it took him two years after that, it took him seven years to win his first NBA championship, and then they got the pieces put together there and, and obviously won six more. But uh, I think Michael learned a lot along those, along that way, along with uh, his teammates and how to play together with him. Obviously bringing uh, Scotty Pippen in was the key factor. I think uh, Jerry Krause, I don't feel, he, he comes up looking not well in this documentary. And I, I think that's the legacy of Jerry Krause that he doesn't have a good reputation. But I, I don't know how many dynasties in any of the sports you can look at Really, those those six championships, the only people that were there for that whole time were, were Michael and Scotty. And uh, Jerry and whoever else was involved in that put pieces around Michael that made him a championship player, made the franchise a championship franchise. So I think Jerry deserves a lot of credit for fitting pieces around Michael and, and Scotty and, and winning those six championships. I think if you look at the Celtics or the Lakers or any of the other dynasties that uh, were long-term dynasties, they had a core of people that stayed there through that whole time, whereas the Bulls just continued to, to build teammates around Michael and Scotty and continue to win. The important question I want to get to, because, of course, Sako, you have talked about the time you spent as a Chicago Tribune reporter and the uh, decorated career of our Dave Corzine. Did you ever write any stories about Dave? <laughs> uh, you mean ones I could publish, Sarah? <laughs> well, uh, one day when we can all be back together, we're going we're to have you tell those stories. But yes, did you publish any on day? He was in a number of game stories. But one story that really comes to mind is after he had a big game against the San Antonio Spurs and helped the Bulls beat the Spurs, um, most of the people had been booing him most of the time at the Chicago Stadium. This time they were cheering him. And none other than Michael Jordan actually um, pointed this out in the postgame interview. Corzine's like Rodney Dangerfield, Michael Jordan said. Now he's starting to get some respect. I almost felt badly for him. He worked so hard 
and never gets any recognition. I think he's playing more relaxed this year. He feels more comfortable with the people that surround him. Anytime you can get Michael to say something good about you, it still holds up 30 years later, doesn't it? I still have frames on the wall here right behind. These stories are incredible. This is too much fun. Uh, Bob, Dave, I can't wait until the next time that we're all together and can tell more of these stories. But in the meantime, this has been such a blast. Sarah, it was great doing this last dance with you and Dave. Sarah, thanks a lot. It was great to see you. It certainly was. And great to see everyone. And thanks for joining us on this Blue Demon Exchange. Until next time, stay safe, be well, and take care, Nepal. Thank you.